Okay, this lecture is going to look at the period between the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and focus on one question, which was how radical was the American Revolution? Now, one big debate among historians is that the American Revolution was not actually that radical. It didn't really change that much other than change the form of government or who was controlling the government from the King of England leaders in the uh, 13 colonies. So some questions and thoughts about to organize your thoughts as we go through this lecture. The first one, was the War for American Independence a revolution? It certainly doesn't look like a revolution from the standpoint if we compare it to the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution or the Chinese Revolution. They were a lot more violent. They were a lot more bloody. Um, it was very clear there were social and economic changes to go along with the political changes. And in this sense, the American War for American Independence doesn't seem to be an American Revolution. Now, the second thing we want to consider, and why this might be, is the diversity of the early colonists. So there are actually a lot of divides, that not everyone was for, let's say, independence. Um, that there was a divide between patriots and loyalists, those who wanted to win independence, the patriots, and the loyalists who wanted to remain part of the British Empire. And later, um, right before the Constitution, you saw a clear divide between federalists, who wanted to give the national government more power, and anti-federalists, who wanted to leave power in the hands of the states and local governments. And I think the last thing I want to think about was all these events that pushed people to see the need for a national government and for a constitution and to replace the Artist Confederation that had started during the War for American Independence and had been basically the governing uh, structure uh, in the period right after the American Revolution or the War for Independence was won. So let's look at this first issue about revolution. Uh, the word often used to describe the American Revolution is a bourgeois revolution. Uh, you might know the term bourgeoisie that's used by Marxists to describe kind of the middle class. Uh, the American Revolution was not a revolution from the bottom up. It was not the poorest of the poor. It was not the worst off that led the revolution. But instead, the revolution was led by mostly wealthy, well-placed, and you could say very fortunate uh, people in the colonies. Uh, George Washington, James Madison, John Hancock were all among the richest men in their societies. Um, so it's hard to say they were suffering so much that that was the cause of the revolution. Instead, you see a revolution that was led by the local notables, uh, in many cases lawyers or planters in the southern plantations. And therefore, it was a bourgeois revolution because it was a revolution not to change the social order, but basically a war between different elites, the interests of the lawyers and planters and merchants of the colonies against the interests of those who were more tied to England and the British Empire. So it comes to, they change leaders, but they, it's not very clear that they change the society. However, some, like historian Gordon Wood, have said that actually the American Revolution was a radical revolution. And we can think of this in another question, is were the founders conservative because what they were arguing for was their rights as Englishmen, meaning the rights they had as being members of the English Empire, as opposed to being part of the French Empire or the Spanish Empire, rights that accorded to people because you were English, or, as in the words of the Declaration of Independence, they were changing it because they grounded their sense of rights in what their form of justice, not on rights as Englishmen, but as rights as human beings. So the Declaration of Independence, when it talks about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, basically uh, called these natural rights. These are God-given rights. And they were creating a new world order. And you see this even on American currency on the back of the uh, $1 bill, You'll see in Latin, Novo Ordo Seclorum, which means New World Order. And this idea that they were creating a new society that wasn't something that drew, came out of their English society and their traditional rights as Englishmen that they were saying were being violated, but grounded on a new understanding of human relationships. So plus ça change, which is French for the more things change. And if you know the expression, the more things change, the more things stay the same. So let's look at politics. Now, the Articles of Confederation weren't a new form of government. Essentially, this is the same framework that existed um, under the Continental Congresses. And more or less, the same things, the same structures, the same ways of governing their politics uh, continued even after the, the war was won. The delegates were not, in a sense, elected. They were appointed by the states, usually by the governor and the legislature of the states. So the people who were serving in the national government didn't have a grounding in, let's say, individual people voting but in the power centers of each of the states, which might be in the hand of, let's say, the dominant families or the wealthiest individuals in those states. Um, 
the national government was economically weak. It didn't have the power to tax. It had to raise, let's say, the money from the states. And they would say, would you please give us some money because we need to pay for the army. And the state could decide to do that or not do that. There were often tariffs between the states that prevented or made it difficult to trade across the state. And each state had its own currency. There was no uh, US dollar or current or coins. Uh, you had New York forms of money, New Jersey forms of money, and so forth. But even more about the politics is that we didn't have political parties. There was no, let's say, Democrats or Republicans, or even, let's say, Democrats and Federalists that would emerge later. Uh, very often, these parties were just groups of friends, or let's say, cliques of power that existed in different states. And therefore, you see very often a, a few families or people with the same last names uh, dominating the politics of the states. So in Georgia, you had the Pink Pinckneys um, and the Rutledges. In Virginia, you had the Randolphs. Um, in New York, you had the Livingstons. Um, you see two Adams in Massachusetts. And I think the other thing about this is that we sometimes uh, think that things that happen now were just the same things that happened then, but politicians didn't really run for election. They basically pretended like, oh, uh, I'm surprised that people supported me, and they would have their friends organize their campaigns, but they wouldn't give speeches. Uh, very often they published editorials that they wouldn't put their name to. Oh, and by the way, you know, there's this large segment of the population that has no political rights. Uh, women could not vote. So as I said, just to wrap it up, the Randolphs and the Harrisons dominated uh, the politics of Virginia. The Livingstons owned a lot of the land in upstate New York and controlled the politics in the state. And because Livingston was a close ally later to Jefferson, kind of pulled New York toward kind of uh, an alliance with uh, the families of Virginia. And then Frilinghusen's, uh, and I might have mispronounced that, um, had a lot of power in New Jersey. So once again, there was very little change in economics. So you still, most Americans were still farmers. While there were some people working in the cities as artisans, most people basically continued the same way they had been living their lives before the revolution. In New York, you had patroons, which means you had these large landowners, and you had basically uh, people who were tenant farmers who rented the land throughout upstate New York. In places like Ulster County and Dutchess County, uh, this was pretty important. And you did have, in the South, the same forms of servitude and slavery that more or less you had before the revolution. So economically, it's not s clear that anything really changed or that anyone's economic state improved. Um, and you still had a society that was dominated in the North by New England merchants and in the South by Southern planters. So why do we have a revolution? Um, and a good way to think about it, I think, is that the revolution united people who had actually very different views about government and justice and their vision for society. And most of it was the uniting thing was an opposition to the policy of George III. And there was more than one way to be opposed to the policies of George III. And you had radicals who wanted to change societies and conservatives that were just mostly concerned with the poor government um, under uh, George III and his, his cabinet. So another way of thinking about this is that some oppose particular policies of a particular politician, while other people were opposed to the idea of monarchy and kingship. And we can call these radicals and conservatives, where the radicals were opposed to monarchy, had been influenced by the Enlightenment, and were wanting to change society wholesale, while conservatives were more reformist, wanting to keep many aspects of Eng the English system of government, which was somewhat democratic, um, but not really trying to radicalize society. And the radical elements were the people that, uh, under Jefferson, would also be very sympathetic to the French Revolution, while the conservatives were mostly from New England and people like Alexander Hamilton and John Adams that really uh, saw a lot to be preserved in the English system. So the radical point of view uh, was mostly concerned with democracy. They wanted to get more people involved. They wanted to give the right to vote to a broader uh, uh, a broader group of people. While the conservatives mostly wanted good government, so they were kind of okay with, let's say, limited government and limited participation, as long as those leaders ruled in the interests of the people and adopted good policies. The radicals, uh, notably um, Thomas Paine, but also Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, grounded their idea in the rights of men, that you have rights because you're human, not because you belong to a particular country. Well, the more conservatives, uh, at least before the revolution, always made their complaints on the idea that as Englishmen, they had certain rights. 
and that those rights as Englishmen were being violated by the English government. And that, so in some ways they were looking back, they're saying, we tr traditionally we already have these rights, but you're not respecting our rights. While the radicals were saying, we have a whole new set of rights based upon the Enlightenment view of the world. The radicals trusted democracy, and therefore they were very okay with democratic majorities and rule by the people. Whatever the people wanted, they should be able to have. While conservatives always wanted to have laws that limited what the public did, because they were somewhat suspicious of the public, and they thought the public was maybe unthinking and also driven by its passions and would not choose the best policies. As a phrase, all men created equal, the phrase in the Declaration of Independence kind of summarized uh, the view of the radicals. While the people who then kind of were closer to the Constitution always grounded things in specific rights that were actually written in documents rather than general theories. Radicals emphasized liberty and freedom. Conservatives emphasized the power of property. Radicals were afraid about the concentration of power in a few people's hands, whether that was a king or the executive power or the national government. While conservatives always talked about mob rule, what will happen when the people get in charge and they just use the uh, government as a way of taking money from some people and distributing it to others? The radicals looked at democratic Athens, ancient Athens, as a model, while the conservatives really looked to Rome and Sparta that had republican forms of government. And it's telling that uh, in the names that were chosen, particularly as pen names when they wrote things for newspapers, uh, many of the Federalists used names that were uh, Latin names referring to ancient Rome, such as Publius, the author of the Federalist Papers. And ultimately these became the Anti-Federalist and the Federalist divide that led into the thinking about and the creation and then the ratification process of the Constitution. So let's look back at some of the key documents. The first one, which is maybe the key document for the, the radicals, is the Declaration of Independence. And the key phrase is from here, all men are created equal, people are endowed with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and the right of the people, and this is probably the key thing of the Declaration of Independence, the people can abolish the government if the government is not serving the interest of the people, which means people come first, not laws. And in this, it was a very anti-authority, anti-government, and particularly the Declaration of Independence cited their criticism as being against the king. They were specifying that George III himself was responsible for these policies. And it was the executive power of the cabinet and of the king and the monarchy that had gone wrong. And very often they were kind of appealing to parliament, of which they more or less approved, a legislature that represented the public and the people, against the power of the king. And, and this goes back to older English debates during the English Revolution, where the power of parliament seemed to represent the people, and the monarchy was kind of a foreign power. And so the difference between the way they understood things was this kind of conflict between the legislature and the executive branch of government. And because many of the people who were thinking were English, this is what was in their mind when they were approaching some of their own issues in the late 1700s. And this makes the uh, Declaration of Independence a very libertarian document, uh, document where more liberty the better, and the less power to the government the better. And therefore this led to calling for radical political and social and economic change. Uh, because once you kind of endorse the consent of the governed, the idea that the public, the whole public, the majority of the public is the source of power, um, it's harder to put limits on that. Because everything you do that doesn't seem to be in the majority opinion is somehow uh, a minority dictating what they think is best to the rest of the people. And this will become the basis for the Jeffersonian under Thomas Jefferson and the Jacksonian, meaning Andrew, President Andrew Jackson, their idea of kind of, let's say, the people decide and a more democratic politics. On the other hand, the key document for the more conservative point of view is the Constitution. Uh, and the Constitution always emphasized not individual people, but the collectivity of the nation. And this is seen in the preamble to the Constitution where we the people, a union, domestic as opposed to foreign, and because the Articles of Confederation was very good about collective security against foreign threats, but the Constitution says about domestic tranquility, meaning things within our borders, common defense, general welfare. And those emphases are important because it changes the point of view from individuals versus their government, as opposed to government being a vehicle to realize our common goals.
And so they were very comfortable with big government, or if not big government, bigger government, uh, giving the national government more power than local powers. And many of the people in the conservatives had been people that fought in the Revolutionary Army and had witnessed as soldiers kind of the dysfunction of the national government under the previous system. Um, and they also had a lot of experience at legislatures, the abuse of legislatures and majorities in legislatures. And James Madison, particularly in Virginia, uh, complained a lot about the majority imposing its will on the minority um, and that the power of these democratic legislatures in the states from the end of the war for independence until the Constitution was an issue in state after state in Massachusetts and Virginia and New York. And what they wanted was not so much the most democratic government but a government that was efficient, a government that was effective, and the words of Alexander Hamilton, an energetic executive. The problem they faced was the tyranny of the majority. And this is why we often say the founders were suspicious of the, of the public, and therefore the Constitution of the United States has a lot of checks on power, and particularly checks on the expression of the will of the majority of the people. Um, what they did is they created a system that favored gradual change. The only way that change could come is you can get all the moving parts of the government going in the same direction. And this became the source of the Federalist under Washington and Hamilton, and later the Whig under various different people during before the Civil War, where you kind of had favored for a larger role in government than the more radical tradition. So let's look at our, our divided nation. Uh, so you see two maps here. The first is the division between loyalists and patriots. Loyalists, those who want to remain, remain part of the British Empire, and patriots that were strong for independence. And what you see is that many of the city areas, uh, Newport, New York, Philadelphia, port cities that were more open to international trade, tended to have a lot more loyalist sympathies than, let's say, the interior that were more independent farmers or uh, backwood, backwoodsmen and things of that sort. Um, and, of course, you also see divided areas on the map in the left that you kind of had to split. And it's generally taken that the people in the colonies were divided a third, a third, and a third during the War for Independence. A third of the people were strongly for independence and referred to themselves as patriots. A third were loyalists and wanting to stay in the British Empire. And the remaining third were kind of like of two minds. Uh, they could go either way. And so in some ways, you can think of the, uh, the War for Independence in some ways like a civil war within the colonies where different people had different senses of loyalties. And if you look, go forward about another 10 to 15 years, you can see similar divides between the Federalists, those who want a strong national government, and anti-Federalists who wanted to keep powers in the states. And the areas in purple, mostly on the coastal areas, um, merchants, traders, uh, industrial, you know, semi-industrial areas, uh, generally had more support for the Federalists. While the interior areas, the ones that were more agricultural farmers or like settlers, tended to be more anti-federalist. And so you had these divides, and these divides were not just state versus state, but also very often divides within the state. So there was a big divide in New York between the area around New York City and the Hudson Valley and the upstate interior areas of New York, and the same thing in Virginia and also North Carolina. So this brings us to the Articles of Confederation. Now, the Articles of Confederation uh, had some strengths and some weaknesses. And its strengths were mostly that it gave Congress the uh, powers to deal with foreign threats, to raise armies, to declare war, and also to sign treaties collectively for all the colonies with foreign powers. What it didn't give them is any powers about domestic administration. So policies that might have, let's say, influenced the economy, provided social services, uh, enhanced trade, were not given to the national government. So the first thing is Congress could not raise money through taxes. It had to basically ask very politely from the state, say, well, we need some support. Would you mind giving us some of the money you've raised to pay our expenses? And on top of that, it had no power to overcome any of the b uh, barriers to trade that existed between the colonies. So they couldn't regulate trade and they couldn't collect tariffs. And there were a lot of tariffs between colonies that were um, creating hindrances and blockages to trade. So this became, let's just focus on the weakness. And this really just kind of goes over the things I just had mentioned. But the first major weakness, and you can see this in the cartoon, was the problem of voluntary taxation, which means they couldn't force people to pay for the cost of government. They had to go around begging, saying, would you like to contribute? 
And what often happened is some states did and many states did not. And as a result, the national government never knew what its budget was because they never knew how much money they were going to collect. And this prevented them from doing anything ambitious about um, becoming a more powerful government or developing the country economically. The second weakness was the problem of interstate commerce, was that many states were blocking or creating tolls or tariffs that frustrated trade between colonies or across colonial b uh, boundaries. Um, because the government couldn't say, well, we're all Americans, everyone trades on the same plateau. Uh, they were often like the colonies were like the European Union or some other, the United Nations, where the national governments retained a lot of power. So another weakness were interstate disputes. Um, which means if two states had a disagreement about their boundary or about fishing rights or things of that sort, there was really no way the national government could mediate or, let's say, bring the states together and impose a solution on them. And finally, um, there was no common currency, which means every state had its own currency, um, and as a result, each state could do more or less what it wanted. Uh, not common currency, which means when people were doing economic transactions, um, they had to change between currency uh, between North Carolina currency, Connecticut currency, and other states, which often meant that they were not sure what things were worth when they were buying and selling across colonial bo boundaries. And so this, all these things were mostly focused on economic issues and how the Articles of Confederation did, did not foster the growth of the new country's economy. So the Articles of Confederation was basically set up as a framework for a wartime government. They were fighting the war for American independence, and they gave the powers to the national government mostly to handle that particular threat, which is how do you organize our defense and our army against the British Empire's troops. Um, its weaknesses were very similar to the United Nations of the European Union, which means they could not impose solutions upon its member countries, and it also gave a lot more power to the states and the national government. The states raised the money. The national government couldn't raise money independent of the states. Uh, the states voted not individuals, which means, as I said before, states appointed uh, the members to the Congress. They were not uh, elected by the members or the individuals within the states. Which, And you might think, well, what's the difference? But sometimes the power at the top of the state, a few people who might control the political system or political machine of a state, could more or less choose people as they pleased, even if that frustrated a lot of people in the states. But also how often happened is if you had, like, the same minority across states, which might lose in each individual state, but for the nation as a whole might be a majority, uh, they were not represented. Another part to this is that representatives were often absent, um, which means they often did not show up to Congress. They were not in Philadelphia, which made it very difficult to cast votes, and therefore it made it difficult to uh, pass any type of helpful legislation, and they could not. However, one of the big issues at this time was what to do with the frontier. So we had the 13 colonies along the Atlantic seaboard, but all the land that belonged to the United States to the Mississippi River was unorganized, and it was claimed uh, by different states. Um, it was also claimed by the national government. And another issue was that England hadn't quite left, even though they had signed a treaty saying this land belonged to the United States. As you can see the map on the left, they had forts all through upstate New York and through the Ohio Valley, where the uh, English still had forts on our territory. Um, and we weren't powerful enough as a country to evict them from these forts and force them back into Canada. So what you're seeing on these maps is basically the different types of claims that were out there uh, and when these were ceded to the national government. Because where the state boundaries existed wasn't always clear. We know what people claimed, but sometimes two states claimed the same piece of land in the West. If you look to the right, you can see the years that they ceded the land to the national government, but also what states claimed which areas. And essentially what states did is they claimed all the land, kind of like in horizontal lines, all the way to the Mississippi. So you can see there's a slice that Massachusetts claimed, a slice claimed by Connecticut, a slice claimed by New York State, Virginia, North Carolina, and Georgia, as you went from north to south. Now, some states claimed a lot of this territory, but other states, such as New Hampshire, had no claims, or Pennsylvania had no claims beyond its own state. And this seemed unfair because how could you create a state that had a territory in the west, but most of the state was located on the eastern seaboard?
If you think of the states as separate countries, this is not a problem. But if this northwestern and frontier land belonged to the nation as a whole, and perhaps they were going to be their states of their own, how do you admit these new states and how do you create new states beyond the original 13? So this is one of the issues, and what they passed in 1787 was the Northwest Ordinance. And it's important because it basically sets out a way of settling this territory. And it's also important because it creates the precedence for things that would come into, that would eventually be part of the Constitution. So it was in the Northwest Ordinance, in this land that it was not controlled by states, where you have the first establishment of the freedom of, of religion. Uh, many of the due process rights, such as jury trials and uh, cruel and unusual punishments, uh, were established first here in the Northwest Territories. And most importantly is that it banned slavery above the Ohio River, which basically put a check on the growth of slavery. And even though slavery might have thrived in some of these territories, um, this legal barrier uh, prevent, basically controlled and kept slavery concentrated in the South. Um, and it, as I said before, it created kind of a procedure for new states to join the Union and then surveyed this land, you can see, created these hori uh, uh, horizontal and vertical lines uh, to divide into different towns in the new territories. Another aspect of this, that it set aside some of, the, uh, one of the uh, blocks to support public education. Which means that wasn't necessarily the school's block, but the sale of that land, the money from that, would be used to establish a public school. And this is important for the future growth of our country because it created a funding mechanism to support schools, uh, a fund. And even though it was not what the budgets are today, it did allow us Americans to be highly, more highly educated than many of the countries at the time. And this Northwest Territory eventually became, you know, the states of Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and part of Minnesota. And so this land up here in the Northwest, hence the Northwest Ordinance, was basically set aside as a slavery-free zone but also created many of them would later become the Constitution, which had not been passed yet. So what I want to show you is about the banning of slavery in the Midwest territories. And so what you see on this map here below is what states, different, uh, different states abolished slavery. And what I think you can see is that many states in the Midwest abolished slavery well before even states in the Northeast. While New England was pretty good about abolishing slavery relatively early, um, some states, like, like Pennsylvania, didn't ban slavery until 1850, only 10 years before the Civil War, while most of the Midwest had already banned slavery, such as Ohio in 1803, Indiana and Illinois in 1816 and 1818, and obviously the southern states had never banned slavery. They had slavery up to the, uh, the Civil War and only um, banned slavery because of the loss in the Civil War. So. Another thing just to think about is the shape of towns. And even though this might not be that important, um, what you see here on the right is the, a map of the towns in the, the Hudson, uh, the tri-state area around New York City. And you can see that towns are shaped in all different kinds of shape, mainly because they use rivers or mountain ranges or various other things to kind of draw town lines. And so you kind of have this mishmash of shapes um, for towns while out in the West, they basically had the surveyors and they drew, you know, sharp north-south and sharp east-west lines to divide uh, the land in each of the towns. And so if you look here at an early map of Illinois, and Illinois was settled mostly from the south to the north um, because of the Ohio River and the Mississippi River meeting there, you can see that they have more of a rectangular shape. So these are drawn like surveying lines. And if you look at like a map of modern Illinois, you can see more or less that with a few exceptions, uh, which indicate some of the rivers that run through Illinois, you more or less have rectangular and square-shaped towns. And the reason why you do is because the process of dividing up land in new territories as they're being settled. Um, and these towns didn't really have anything to do with pre-existing settlements. So I want to talk about two events that directly led to the Constitution. The first one is Shays' Rebellion. Um, so with all this, you know, opening of land in the West, um, particularly on the frontiers, even within the states of the uh, original 13 colonies, uh, you had a lot of land speculation. People were clearing the land. They were expecting to grow their economy because this land was not claimed by anyone. Uh, there was no limitations about setting the land. Like the Proclamation of 1763 kept people from moving West and setting land that Indians had been 
um, resident on. And this led to kind of slash and burn, people going out, putting up farming homesteads, borrowing money to buy this land. Um, and there was a lot of speculation, which means the price of land went up. And then there was kind of a collapse of kind of very much like the real estate market in uh, 2006, uh, widespread foreclosures on the frontier. Uh, they couldn't afford to pay back their loans and they couldn't pay the taxes on the land. And many of these people were, a lot of this land was given to former officers and soldiers in the Continental Army who had felt they had served their country and they were given this land as part, as part of the payment for their services. And now they were defaulting the land and losing their land. Um, and so there was a lot of sympathy for them because many of them had, like Daniel Shays, the leader of the Shays Rebellion in Massachusetts, had served their country. Um, but the most important thing, the, I mean, it wasn't so much a rebellion that had a chance for succeeding in overturning the country, but it did convince a lot of people that state governments were not large enough or big enough to, to control these rebellions of this size, and therefore we needed a larger national government uh, to be able to handle these internal disputes. And in a sense that it kind of made the case for a national constitution uh, just before the Constitutional Convention was met. The last one is the Annapolis Convention. And the Annapolis Convention in 1786 was kind of like a dry run or a practice for the Constitutional Convention. And it was a convention mostly to deal with these trade barriers and these economic issues created by the Articles of Confederation. Um, and so there was a call for, um, to all the colonies to send representatives. However, only five states, than most, the nearest five states to Annapolis, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Virginia, and strikingly enough, Maryland, even though it was held in Maryland, didn't send any representatives. You had 12 total representatives from these five states. Uh, they didn't have enough states to pass any uh, binding legislation, uh, so they did what you do when you can't do anything. You issue a report. They made a report on the issues involved economically and suggestions to improve them. Um, Hamilton meets Madison, so you have two important people in the constitutional process basically meeting for the first time, uh, sharing their ideas, and they would become key individuals in the Constitutional Convention, um, both as representatives of two large states, New York and Virginia, but also people who would defend the Constitution ratification, and people who have a huge hand in writing large parts of the Constitution. And without the Annapolis Convention, these two people would not have become, let's say, friends and associates uh, working toward this national cause. The last thing that it did is it basically said, well, we should meet again. How about we meet again next year in Philadelphia? And that meeting in 1787 became the Constitutional Convention. So in our next lecture, we're going to talk more about the details of the Constitution. But we shouldn't have an understanding what was going on, that there were all these uh, problems with the Articles of Confederation being too weak to help the economy and maybe being too weak to deal with some internal disturbances. And therefore, there seemed to be a need for uh, a stronger government, but not everyone believed, had the same idea of what that government should be, and not everyone wanted a stronger national government. So I'll see you next time. Thank you.